Welcome back, guys. Um, we've got our next clinic uh, lined up and ready to go here, but I was just watching a few of the ads pass by, and just a reminder, if you uh, are going to jump on there and grab any of our merch, um, don't forget you can use the discount code uh, and get 20% off on, on any orders, and some of the proceeds go back to helping build this as a bigger and better um, convention and, and social gathering for us all. So up next, we've got Michael. Um, he has a clinic that really has caught my interest. Um, I know nothing about it, but lighting your scenery without wiring has seriously got some um, something funky going on there. So it's caught my attention. Um, I'll hand it over to Michael to give himself a bit of a, a background intro to you and we can go from there. Over to you, Michael. Thanks very much, Brad. Hey, it's great to see all you guys out there this morning. And um, as you can probably hear from my accent, I've got a similar one, somewhat similar to Brad's, but you've probably got used to it by now. So we'll say fair income and words like that. But uh, no, I'm trying to avoid most of those Aussie slangs. Just finished my Vegemite breakfast, so I'm good to go. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've got a layout here in central Pennsylvania. That's where I'm located now. Um, I was born in England, grew up in Australia. Uh, worked in Germany, now in the United States. So I actually do trumpet shows at some meetings, not playing trains, but trumpets. And um, I always uh, go to assi assisted living homes and they often ask me, well, where are you from? And so on. So I give them a tiny bit of my background. And then I say, well, you could probably call me incontinent. Well, that goes down like a ton of bricks, doesn't it? Anyway, um, back, to, back to the train stuff. Um, so I'd just uh, like to tell you a little bit about the lighting that I got involved with, and um, actually, it's all going to be very self-explanatory. So, Brett, there we go. Perfect. Hit that video, Martin. Well, hello. My name's Michael Groves, and I'm here to talk to you today about a revolutionary way to light your hobby using fiber optics. And I really want to thank Hurt and Gordy for bringing this program to us because usually I'd be at a show like this as many of you would be. Um, this was the Amherst show back in January of this year. So this gives us a huge opportunity to come in front of a whole lot of our friends and people and uh, just enjoy some time together. Well before we go into this presentation I just want to show you a little bit about the layout and you're going to see a little bit of what we've done on it. So this is part of the layout that we have in the basement and just showing you, giving you an idea of what it looks like, obviously without any of the lights on it. This is a section that actually I've worked quite hard on in terms of putting some lights into it. Um, and you'll see this uh, during parts of this talk. But of course, adding lights really does change everything. It really comes much more alive. And there's even lights there on the, the cars. And then as we come across, come back to sort of the English village scene, you might say, with, with the Rolls Royce there and the traffic island in a church. The lighting really does change the dynamic considerably. I'd like to give you now a brief history of my model railroading. Really it started at age 11 and then promptly stopped at age 13 because we left England, went to Australia and I went to boarding school there, played a lot of music, did a lot of different things, started working and it wasn't until age 31 that my son, age seven, was given a train set by my wife, who then said to both of us, it is time for you to play together. And so that's when my hobby started all over again. But then at age 55, I stored, the, I sawed the whole play piece into uh, parts because we were moving from New Jersey into Pennsylvania. And so I didn't have a machete at handy, so there's my saws all laying there and we cut it apart. It's pretty brutal, 
Uh, my son uh, put up with it. He'd done a lot of the hard work of laying trestles, uh, hand laid track and so on. Um, but we made it and we moved uh, back and uh, moved to Pennsylvania. Now, one of the things that I learned though, was that rejoining sections is a royal pain. And the second thing I learned during this process was that reviewing, rewiring rather, is a absolute headache. And of course, what had happened was I actually had laid out my basement. My wife had told me to lay it out before putting the train room in. And by that time, all the labels had fallen off the wires and I didn't know which wire was which. Well, before we get any further I'm going on this, I'm going to talk a little bit about then what had we used for lighting? Well, we started with grain of wheat bulbs. Um, my son put these together for us. I rarely, if ever, turn those on. Why? Because if they burn out, we're stuffed. <laughs> I'm not going to replace them. Um, I have a, a railway station up there with um, these grain of wheat bulbs and they still look very attractive. But what I learned is, of course, they're very small and bright. They're horribly difficult to solder. Um, lots of wiring involved and um, horribly difficult to replace. Fortunately, I haven't had to replace any of them. Then, of course, along came LED lights, and so I worked into that. And LED lights have some specific uh, challenges. One is that there's an anode and a cathode, so in fact, they're polarized. You can't just wire them uh, without regard of polarity. So that is a bit, bit of a challenge. Um, in implementing LED lights, but most people have got over that. Um, I went to a website, uh, which many of you are familiar with, Evans Designs, and they've got this huge range of LEDs, great, um, and different colours, really fancy stuff. But then I looked at another slide on Evans Designs, and I said, well, that's interesting. All that wiring, am I going to go through all of this again, or am I going to do something different? And of course, my biggest concern was to end up with spaghetti wiring. And that's something you want to be super aware of. In fact, um, Rick Wilkins at 2009 Amherst meeting showed me this um, board, control board. Then he flipped it over and uh, showed me the spaghetti that's there at, right there. And basically I would just say, don't let this happen to you. Well, one of the nice creations has come from Woodland Scenics and they've produced a system in which they've integrated all of the wiring into boxes. So it's really what they call a just plug system. Very attractive from the point of view of you don't have to sort out polarities or wires. All you do is just plug the system together. Now it comes with many components and that for me is a bit of a challenge because if I'm ordering or if I'm putting something together, I've got to plan my ordering from them in order to get the right components. There's also a fair amount of real estate required. Um, and that's, as we're going to see, is a bit of a challenge. So LEDs, summary. Inexpensive, long lasting, polarity and voltage are critical. Spaghetti wiring is still a challenge unless you use something like the plug, just plug system from Woodland Scenics. So why didn't I go with a just plug system solution? First of all, I found it a bit expensive. Two, it takes up a lot of space underneath the layout with all those control boxes. But I think most importantly for me, it limits creativity. I enjoy being creative and having a system like this limited what I could be doing. So then I thought, well, how about fiber optics, right? No wiring, easy to install, but how are you gonna power these things? Now, people have told me, you know, you can't do that, Michael. Well, you don't say that to a physicist. And that's my background, um, because that was the big challenge. And so I worked on thinking about it, and I thought, what would be some key attributes for a lighting system? So here they are. Realism was around a really key. Reliability, ease of installation, needed to be cost effective. And again, for me, really important to provide for imagination. So I set to work and there's my system. Um, it consists of some fibers into a heat shrink tube, 
The other end of that is a LED that actually is used in cars, headlights. A nice big heat sink on it and a fan at the back of it to keep it cool. Um, and then a, a small power supply. And so I lived with that for a couple of years on my train layout and started building um, the whole system up and enjoyed that until really my grandson came along at age 13 to me and started working on some electronics. And that was rather fun. We started working together. And of course I recognized, well, he's probably got some engineering skills. And if he's gonna to go to university for engineering, it's gonna cost a whack of money. Um, how about we start a company to pay for that? So that's how the company came about, was talking with Austin and um, in fact helped name the company uh, as well as the product. And that's our first product was the Lamp Lighter One, which you see there, um, into which you plug the fibers. And the idea really is conceptually very, very simple. All we do is take the Lamp Lighter One, take a fiber, drill a hole, run it up into a building, you got light. Take a, a light, alternative, a lamp, say, and you can run that down, the fiber down, into the lamp lighter. It couldn't be simpler. In fact, that's what I discovered from my own layout. So here's one of our lamps, uh, perched over the top of a, a Rolls Royce. Naturally, I had to have a Rolls Royce. I've given up thinking about owning one of those now, so this is probably as far as I'm ever gonna get. Um, and here you can see it actually in situ with um, some of the buildings lit around there, some of the uh, swan neck lamps, there's a roundabout there, all the normal things, and an English um, crossing gate as well. Um, a little bit closer and you can get a better, better idea of the focus of this light um, onto the roadway. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a moment. Well, you know, it's really great to just add lighting where you want. So you can see those guys in the picture there, they're digging in a road. And of course, they're always, um, we're always digging roads up and filling them in. That seems to be what goes on all, all the time, much to motorists' annoyance. But when I didn't have a light there, nobody really noticed it. But as soon as I popped a little light on there, boing, it really popped out. And of course, there's a little mini miner there uh, with a light shining on it. But you'll notice that, in fact, for the light, it's really a nice conical, about a 40 degree spread on that beam, unlike an LED, which is more typically about 135 degree spread. Now, I took some of these to round to one of my friends uh, in the area, and Al Judy, and he actually um, took some of them, uh, rusted them up, made them look um, older, um, and, and put them on his scenery. So that was rather fun. Well, of course, I have to have somebody to make these, and there's one of our dwarves. He's the youngest, Benjamin. And there he is making a set of swan neck lamps. And those are the ones that are around on quite a lot of layouts uh, around the world now. Well, one of the things I do like is an English pub. And so I built one from scratch, just out of my own mind and so on. But I obviously wanted to put a whole load of lighting into it. So I did that. Um, and I wanted to put some lighting up into the trees because I love that sort of fairy lighting feel. And there we are, small fibers, just poke them up into a tree, very simple. Um, but I also wanted to have some lighting on the, um, underneath the umbrellas. So there was lighting on the tables. And again, very easy, just put a fiber up there and I've got lighting. So the next slide actually just shows you a railway station behind that pub. And I didn't put a light on at that time where those men are digging and you can't see them at all. They're right there next to the London taxi. Well, there's my fibre spaghetti. And um, yeah, you obviously do end up with a bit of a spaghetti. But the nice thing about it, I was worried about it at first, was there's a glow from those fibres. So I turned the lights off completely and I got underneath and I could see exactly where every light was. That's tremendously useful when you want to move things around. Um, it's also interesting for children, as uh, Paul McCarty, who's one of my customers, uh, discovered, and he sent me this great picture of his grandchildren looking up at the fibre spaghetti underneath his layout. So, here was the lamplighter design. Needed a very bright LED. I wanted to make it sure it was easy to mount, so it's just got a couple of screw holes there. There's very few components needed to do the lighting, 
and it's very easy to trace the lighting. So if you look at it overall, it's really what I think of a two or three component system. So there it is, there's the lamp lighter box and some fiber. Well, maybe you want to put some lamps on. So here we go. So we've got a lamp lighter and some lamps, or maybe all three. So we want some fiber into buildings, we want some lamps and so on. So basically, with three components and a drill, you're away. Let's take a look at what happens is I looked at the layout that's right behind me um, and I've got a six foot section here that I've lit. And I want to describe that a little bit in terms of the components and compare what it is with my system or the Dwarven system versus say using something like the Just Plug system. So here we go. So I've got 16 buildings lit up. I've got 22 street lamps. I've got three umbrellas and one tree. Um, I use three lamp lighter one boxes underneath the layout and the cost for all of that list is $400. Well remember there's a lot of components in the just plug system so I called them up and I said okay so what do I need to do in order to make this work for me so I described the system and you know knew exactly what I needed for lighting of course and this is what I came they came back to me with um, and you can see it's just quite a lot of components and you've got to get it right. Otherwise you're going to be having to order again and wait and, and so on. But the cost of the system is $560. So that's a little bit more. The other thing though, with the real estate requirements, um, you can see they like to have sort of a linear array of those um, little modules that they've got. So if you took the Just Plug system with say 13 boxes, which is what they're suggesting, assume a half an inch between them, you end up with about four foot four of space underneath my layout at the front that's fully taken up. And I've only got six foot and it's on a curve, in fact. The Dwarven system, it's only three boxes, uh, mount them where you need, and, um, and again, my layout's six foot wide. So, so to lay that out, it was going to be a lot more of a challenge. Now, I want to answer another question, which is important, which is what does it really cost then to light, to, you know, to put one light into a system. So the lamp lighter box um, will accommodate 13 of the 1.5 millimeter fibers, that's the diameter, or 28 of the one millimeter fibers. Um, so on an average, you'd probably use about 20 fibers for different light structures, um, depending upon how much light you need in each of those structures. And so total list cost for the starter kit that includes 30 foot of fiber is $85. So the cost per structure for the lighting is $4.25 each. Let's take a look for a moment at how that compares with Woodland Scenics. Again, I'm not going to go through all the components there, but adding them up, this cost was $231, and so a cost per structure of the lights was $11.50 to do the same job, and that's really quite a lot more. Let's go back for a moment and talk about some having some imagination and fun. So I put together a diorama, which I take around to most of the shows, and it just shows off a number of different lamps. But one of the fun things that I did with it, and you can see that here, um, you can see there's a camp, a tent. Um, and what I did was stick a, a very small fiber up there because obviously you don't want it really glowing. Um, there's also a car back there with its headlights on. Actually, I put one millimeter fibers in there and it probably could have done with 0.75 because it looks like it's got its high beam on uh, crazily. But um, anyway, so you can light cars uh, easily. There's my old, one of my old cars. Uh, it was looking a bit disheveled, so I just stuffed some lights into it. So that's the product that we came up with. And my second oldest grandson, or youngest grandson, I should say, is David. And uh, he does all the manufacturing now of those lamp lighter boxes. And so I thank him. He's one of our dwarves, as we call him. So we've got a bunch of different products. We've got an HO carriage lamps, HO globe lamps. Um, and those are actually produced using 3D printed uh, bases and, um, and posts. Um, so really, it's quite an interesting technology. Then we have some highway lamps that took a while to develop as we, I was looking for a way in order to get the fiber come up and then do a right angle, the light to do a right angle bend. So there's actually a mirror in the top there to produce the light 
um, down onto or shine down onto the highway. But then came out with industrial building lamps. Um, it was interesting, we took those to a show and actually it was the NMRA last year. And within four hours, we'd sold out completely. That was a big surprise to me. And that that's actually probably our biggest selling product today um, in terms of lamps. Well, we also have scaled into the O gauge. So we've got uh, Swan Necks for them, the Carriage Globe Lamps. Now, that's an interesting area because one of my concerns was, you know, that's going to probably require a bit more light than an HO setup. So we developed a lamp lighter two box. It's what I think is the big brother to lamp lighter one. Um, has basically about 50% uh, increase in uh, light output and it's double the capacity of the fibers compared to the lamp lighter one. So again, I've designed it really for the O scales, um, but also for HO people who maybe want to uh, do a whole village. So um, in fact, we'll talk about it in a moment, how I replaced some of my Lamplighter 1s with the Lamplighter 2 um, in order to consolidate and reduce the cost of my layout even. But what surprised me is I've had a bunch of end scalers who've actually bought this product and it's clear that they just wanted to have one box to light everything on their very compact layout. So actually, if you took a look at what happens if you move to a Lamplighter 2 uh, box in terms of its cost effectiveness, um, an average of 40 fibers uh, to light different structures, again, using that similar arithmetic I did before. The total cost then uh, for a starter kit is $139, and that includes 60 foot now of fiber. Um, and so the cost per structure drops down to $3.46. So what I did, as I said, I substituted a lamp lighter two box for my layout, on my layout. And now for all these components, my list cost drops to $284 compared to, again, the Woodland Scenics at $560. So I think you can see there's quite a value in, in doing that, making that move. Well, let me now change gears completely for a moment and just talk about some local tips, uh, tips for using fiber optics. Because for many of us, some, some of us know a lot about them, but I've had to come along the learning curve myself. Um, and the first thing I'd like to talk about is cutting them. Do never use wire cutters. What it does is it pinches the fiber instead of slicing. You want to slice through it. The best is in fact a utility knife. Uh, alternative are some shearing action cutters, which have very firm, stiff blades in them. That'll give you, or even um, some wire uh, strippers, they often have a scissor-like action at the end of those, uh, or at the beginning part of those, and that will give you an excellent cut. Very important to do. Well, many times you really want to change the color of the light. I came across these uh, Tamiya translucent paints, and just dab an, uh, onto a paintbrush, a little bit of red onto the end of a fiber, and hey presto, I got my house on fire very very easy approach to changing the colors and indeed so there it is um, in one of my other buildings in fact one of my buildings behind me and key with fiber optic lighting there's no heat dissipated here near the building at all it's all dissipated in the lamp lighter box that's a bit of a freebie uh, as i might say um, i always put um, tissue paper or something behind the windows so that you're not seeing directly into the building. Um, and one day I just uh, ran some cranes across it, just like a child would, and slapped that up. And hey presto, there I had curtains. Wow, that was a cheap way to do it. Anyway, as I say, that's a freebie. Um, last Christmas I was playing around and I thought, you know, what if I nick this fiber? My wife had been doing that actually at a show. So we did that and um, I then just painted those green, red, green, red, and yeah, you can see what comes up. It looks like Christmas lights. So this last Christmas, I did another thing, which is there's my English pub. And of course you want to have Christmas lights on it. There's 60 lights on that outside of that pub. It took me half an hour to do all of that work. Just imagine trying to do that with LEDs. 
So, but the first time that I showed this product, actually somebody asked me, well, how do you change the intensity? I said, well, you can't really. And then I thought, what a fool you are, Michael. All you need to do is just pull the fiber slightly out of the box and it's going to decrease the light intensity. So that's the very simple way. If it's too bright, you can just change the light intensity very easily. Now, obviously, bending fibers is kind of important. The, the very thin fibers, well, they'll bend around anything, but a 1.5 millimeter fiber is a little bit on the stiff side. Um, so what I've found out that you can do very easily is if you use boiling water, don't put your hands in it, but if you use boiling water, um, I use some aluminum tubing on the fiber, you can bend that fiber into shapes and it will hold that shape as soon as you take it out of the boiling water. I haven't found that at all on websites. They usually talk about where you don't melt the fiber. So you can make multiple bends to go around corners and so on. But do be careful because if you make too sharp a bend, then you're going to lose some of the light. And in this particular case, the bend is very sharp and I've got quite a lot of light loss. What's going on, of course, is the fiber holds the light in it and the light bounces back and forward, back and forward. But and up and down but as soon as it comes to a corner if the bend is too sharp you're going to lose some of the light so I actually have some guidelines for typical bend radiuses um, so for a 1.5 millimeter fiber I recommend a minimum uh, radius of about six millimeters and for a, a one millimeter fiber it's about four millimeters but having said that experiment with it because you could see on that Christmas um, the pu or pub lit up actually had the fiber coming up a drain pipe basically looking like a drain pipe and making a fairly sharp bend and I still had plenty of light in it so uh, how about connecting fibers well maybe you cut it too short maybe you've got a modular layout and you just want to be able to take things apart or maybe you want to connect a number of different fibers smaller ones into a larger one and I've done that especially when I'm um, lighting cars, that's exactly what I do. So a very simple system. Um, what I've done is I've taken some aluminum tubing, cut it down to about an inch long, and then I use a coupling um, solution, which is actually a silicone gel that has the same optical density or refractive index, as we call it, as the fiber, as about 1.5 refractive index, and what it does is it doesn't allow the light to escape. So when you're butting the two fibers together and there's an air gap, there'll be about 30 to 40% loss of light. With this approach, you reduce that loss very considerably. So there, what I do is I take a fiber, I stick it into the uh, aluminum tube, put some of that gel on the other end of it when it's poking out, pull the fiber back in a bit and connect it to the other fiber that I want to join up with. Those are the KNS um, tubes that I use for the 1.5 and the 1.0 millimeter fibers. And so we end up with those connector kits and we have them for a 1.5 millimeter fiber and a 1.0 as well. People often ask, well, what happens? How do you keep the fibers in the box? Well, we have a grommet at the end that has, as you can see, fins on it, and that really holds the fiber in place. Um, if you only put one or two fibers in, naturally they're going to fall out, but then again I'd ask why do you need a box like this for just two lights. Um, but once you put about three in, it's going to grab them. The other thing about fibers though, fibers tend to be cylindrical. They have been wrapped around a drum and they come off that and they naturally want to take that shape. So when you stick the fiber into, if you stick only a few fibers into a box, you'll end up with the fiber not being parallel with the axis of the box. And what that just means is it's not going to pick up the light inside very well. So what I recommend is if you're not using a lot of fibers, if you're using a lot of fibers, it straightens everything out. If you're only using a few fibers, and let's say you're only using 20 in, in, a, um, in a lamp lighter 2 box, Insert some other fibers, sort of dud ones, or plastic stirring straws, whatever, that at least three inches in length so they don't fall inside the box and so on. Um, 
and that's going to straighten your fibers out and it's, it will give them increased um, efficiency of light collection. So very, very simple approach. So let me just sort of now go back and sort of come, summarize what I see as the key benefits that I've discovered as I've worked with fiber optic lighting. Number one is the realism aspect. Um, it's very easy to light so many different buildings, structures, and again, adjust the intensity to what I need. I can literally light, uh, apply light, add lights in seconds. I had a test recently where I was, uh, I put a village together or I had a village and I wanted to light it and I put in nine lights and it took me 10 minutes to do the whole job. And then I could get, sit back, have a cup of coffee and enjoy the scenery. But of course that's because there's no wiring involved. And that for me, as I've got older is, is a key, key aspect. Um, again, no heat dissipated in the buildings. That's key. I can have it as bright as I want and know that I'm not going to have any issue with whether I'm using tissue paper nearby or anything like that. Um, I believe it's a cost effective solution and you can tell that. Um, but I think it allows for a lot of creativity. And I think finally, people have been saying to me, and this is something I've been learning recently, um, they've said, Michael, this really is the next generation of lighting. We've gone from grain of wheat bulbs to LEDs and now fiber is going to be the new wave. And I think you can really see why, <laughs> because obviously this is a challenge for most people, but plus it's much easier to stick a fiber into very, very small spaces. So again, uh, yeah, well, my wife got a bit crazy and decided that my drill needed to have some, um, yeah, social distancing and a face mask on it. So anyway, um, but we, so we have the lamp lighter one, we have fiber and a drill. So that's all you really need. So my motto is really, it's a three-step process. Attach the lamp lighter underneath your layout, drill the holes, stick up the fiber, and you're done. I don't know about you, but I love seeing other people's layouts. And um, so we've put on our website, we've got a, what we call a customer showcase. And I'm really pleased with the number of customers who are sending in images of what they've been doing. So I'd like to really give you a bit of a flavor for that. Um, just a bit of a buzz, I think. Um, one of the first ones was by Mark Jewett. Mark does a lot of reviews for NMRA magazine. And back in May 2019, um, he put this in and he put this actually into the magazine. And that was a, yeah, quite a delight for us. There's some globe lamps and he's lit the inside of the train station. By the way, the train station was immobile. So he was actually, couldn't move that. He had a drill underneath and he was worried that initially he wouldn't be able to get any lighting in it. But of course, a small hole, the lights there. He was really pleased with that. Some more lighting. Oh, and one of the fun things he did was um, he put some lighting into uh, four headlights into that car. I'll take my hat off to him. Better than I could do, actually. Paul McCarty, and Scaler sent me some images. Really nice scenery there. Um, and I love this one. There's a guy reading his newspaper underneath the light just outside the library. And this is an interesting scene, I think you'd admit. Paul's actually worked on some uh, moon lighting um, so that uh, he's, he's really got sort of an ethereal effect there. It's, it's very, very interesting. Um, looks like a Thomas Kincaid type of painting uh, to me. So um, I'm longing to go out and take a look at it in first person. So, but here's another. Um, Paul Bacadero, he's it's just nice getting ring. You can see the lamps there, rather, rather fun. And of course, that's, um, there's quite a lot of bright lights around there, or it's quite bright. So you can see how well those stand out. Lynn Clock, he's up in Amherst, and uh, he had some um, interesting layout where he uh, right, lit an, an inn, but he also, um, there he is with right, one of his tugboats lit. But this is what really interested me. He had a, basically a wharf there and, and there's sort of a barge with, with the trucks on it and, and rail lines. And the lighting, he just drilled a hole in the sides and stuck raw fibers out and it looks perfect. The other thing he did was he stuck a fiber underneath the overhang um, there in that building and he's got this light. Now I'd been working on something where I thought I would have to build something 
that would have a 90 degree bend in it so that the light could shine down. No, nope. all he did was run the fiber up, drill a hole in the building, run the fiber out, leave it there. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to see if I could work that on my layout. And there is one of my buildings um, with a small door. And I did exactly the same and got some light on it uh, that way. So very easily. So I threw my project out the window. Uh, I'm hoping a bit later is this church. For example, you can just stick a fiber up surreptitiously through the layout. You don't need, need to sit it far if, through it so it's showing. And it's just going to beam light out onto a building. And here are some uh, very, very nicely lit uh, church. Now, Steve Duranix, he is a Canadian and he does some lovely work um, with buildings. And he'd used our system to light this building, I think quite artistically. And one of my greatest interests here was the signage. So he'd actually lit that signage up using the fiber optics. Great job on that. I've mentioned Al Judy before. Here he is. He's um, lit some of his uh, scenery. And Al does a lot of work with, um, well, as you go see, narrow gauge. And Al, Al said to me, you know, Michael, he said, this is the best thing that's happened to model railroading in the last 10 years. And I must admit, I was rather surprised and taken aback by that. Um, those are some more shots from his. Um, Malcolm Sokol, that's another one, uh, another uh, customer, nice downtown scene. And this one I just got, this from Jim, Jim Roberts. And I love the parking lot with the highway lamps that we've got. And of course, some of the buildings that are lit. Well, I got enthused recently to do some work on my own layout. I rarely get any time to do that. Um, so I decided to put in some of the globe lamps along a waterfront. Very simple job. Um, and the rear of those, I put four lights into the um, rear lights of that car and just painted them red um, and there. And that was a simple job. Um, one of my customers just sent me this from his layout. And of course, he's got the lights all on, but there are the lights on the bus and the lights. So he's really provided a lot of lighting in his system. Well, our newest product is billboards. And we've got a range of different billboards and you can see them here um, lit up on my layout there. You can see that really, even though the lights are on, you can have quite a good effect. Now this says, Trenton makes, the world takes. Now that's a bridge in Trenton, New Jersey. Michael Dettinger, who was at the um, NMRA MER meeting last October in Philadelphia, before that, he'd actually put this together and he asked us, would you please light this bridge? Well, I didn't have a clue how you'd be done. I'm in Australia. Meanwhile, Austin, who is the oldest of my grandsons, our senior dwarf, as we call him, um, got to working on this and came up with some lighting. And there it is. What he did actually was he nicked the fiber uh, and created um, that lighting. And we can talk about that further. Hopefully he's going to write a paper for that, which might come out in one of the magazines and you'll learn exactly how he did that. Well, in April, um, I was very grateful that Cody um, had put together um, so a two page spread in that magazine where he'd taken some lights that had been installed, but had never been lit. And he just took them, pulled them out and put in some of the Twarven lamps, and again, very, very quickly, which sort of demonstrated to him as well as others um, how quickly you can put lights in. Right, I'd like to show you something about lighting a church. So here's the church, and if I take that up, all we've got are three fibers, one millimeter fibers coming up. We've actually got some coffee stirrers stuck in there so as to keep the fibers fairly straight, and you can see it's very easy to move them in and out of there. Um, on the church itself, we've put some foil on the bottom, of, on the roof rather of it. Um, and also where we've got the windows, we've actually uh, coated those so you can't see through the um, plastic. That's a typical problem with many of the models around. So the plastic tends to be rather thin. Of course, there's some gravestones attached to the side. Well, we'll put them back down so they can enjoy being sitting down there. And then we've got the effect of yep, 
the light on there. Now one of the things you will notice is in fact that there's quite a bit of light on the front of this church and it's really coming from this little light down here. In fact, if I put my finger over there, you can see the effect of that. That's just a single fibre that has been stuck, drilled, uh, drilled a hole, stuck the fibre down there. All you can see is the end of that fibre and because of the spread of the light, it gives you a nice glow onto the church building. So what we need to do now is just go and turn the lights down a bit more so as to really make the scene pop a little bit more. I think you can see that's quite an attractive church. And again, you can really see the effect of that light, light on the front. It's difficult for me to put my hand in front of it. And that's a good way to be able to light buildings easily. Well, so here's the summary of the different um, products that we have. We have uh, the swan neck lamps, globe lamps, carriage lamps, industrial building lamps, hybrid lamps, different sizes of five or four different sizes that we carry. We also um, have just released um, our billboards and one of the newest products we're working on is flashing fibers and individually flashing fibers, which can be changed and so on in terms of their flash frequency. And I think that's gonna be an exciting product, um, another lamp lighter product that we're gonna be coming out with. So here's some pricing on them, and I realize this sounds a little bit commercial, but here we go. Um, we've talked about the Lamplighter 1 starter kit. It has 30 foot of fiber in it, 85. So manual sets of three lamps, $19 for three of those. And then the fibers, you can see the range of pricing there and for the connectors. Well, I want to thank um, you for listening to this. Um, and also I want to thank Austin, David, Benjamin, my grandsons, Joel, my son-in-law, Heidi, my daughter, Shirley, my wife. Um, and thank you for your interest in watching this. And of course, we're in some peculiar times right now, but that's the team. And uh, we just thank you so much. Open for questions. Bye for now. <clears throat> okay we're back here in the studio i had a bit of a fumble with the mouse then trying to get the uh, the right buttons to press but i believe i've actually unmuted my microphone i better go and check that because uh the last time we did nmrax i uh i left my microphone uh, muted for a while until we started seeing uh comments in the chat that no one could hear me which isn't unusual if you know me online uh, okay, that was a, a great video, Michael. Um, uh, there was some, quite some interesting uh, information in there on how to treat and how to install uh, fiber optic lighting. Uh, I remember in my early days of doing um, scale model planes when I was a, a kid, uh, a kid, um, I ended up using fiber optic lights for a, uh, I think it was a 124th scale B29 I did so that all the uh, instrument uh, gauges actually lit up. So uh, so the, the principles that you had in that video can be applied to any type of fibre installation, basically, I take it. Absolutely. Yep, yep. We've actually um, I actually had somebody who bought a, one of those big sort of Falcon uh, models, Lego ones, and uh, they bought our system to put it in, and um, we've got people even putting it up on Lego uh, sets and... Um, all over the place. What's interesting about that, Martin, is um, you know there were articles back in um, Model Railroader back in the 1970s that described a lot of um, what I've actually done here. The only challenge was there wasn't the lighting source. Um, yes. It's been around. It's just now, I think, coming of age because of the technology that's available. And I'm very grateful for that. It helped me out. With the advent of the uh, ultra miniature LEDs, I mean, you go back 10 years ago and the smallest uh, method of illumination would have been a, a grain of rice incandescent globe or the likes. Uh, whereas now you can get LEDs that are, what, 0402, which I think are less than a millimetre by a millimetre, and they look like uh, just two bits of wire, but then when you put power to them, they actually glow at the end. Um, have you seen a... Uh, 
a, a downturn in fiber use use of fiber because you can now get such small LEDs? I think there's there's actually room for, for both. One of the interesting things is where you're a green application is when you're um, say lighting up cars or vehicles and so on. And I've had a couple of customers come to me and say, look, I was just tired of fiddling around with tiny wires and trying to poke these things down. Because the problem is, you know, an LED at the end of these tiny flimsy wires just doesn't hold well. Whereas if you take a fiber, it's actually going to just sort of push it straight down. The light just comes out of the end. It's yeah. very easy to handle. So people have actually come back to me and said, now this tends to be the easier way to, yes. to implement those. As someone who sat here with a microscope and soldered wires on the end of an 0402, um, I, I, I can agree with you there. It, it, it probably would be less daunting to use uh, that technology. So, Brad, over in um, Facebook, have we got any uh, any questions or have you have any? Uh... Well, there's, there's been a couple of little questions. I think some of them were a little early on. Um, and I think you answered them later in. Uh, James asked, can fiber optic cable withstand a tight bend? Um, I saw like see from down here that obviously doesn't need his beauty sleep like me and you, Martin. Um, he's still up. Yep. He asked, um, do you have to do anything with the end of the fiber as it exit the light fittings? No, actually, that's great. But that is a great question. The, clear, the keenest thing is to give it a really 40 degrees as it comes out. It enters a bit about 30 degrees into a fiber exits into air at about 40 degrees. If you really want to spread that a bit more, what I do is I just take a fiber and I'll just take my wife's, uh, go up to my wife's uh, gas stove. I'll just go like that onto it until I, and then I measure the diameter. And once I've uh, increased it by 70% or so, it's going to have a nice uh, domed end on it. And now the splay is going to be much broader. So if I want something that's a bit broader splay, um, greater visibility from the side, that's exactly what you do. But there's um, no need to do anything, anything fancy that we normally see being done in the telecommunications business. Okay. Um, the only other question was from Ian is, how do you recommend uh, you protect the fibers underneath your layout from damage um, while you're under there working on your layout? Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, if you let them dangle too much, you might get strangled with them. So, um, yeah, one of the approaches is just to put them in a, a wire bundle. So that's very easy. You can get these ones that open up very easily. You can put those in. Um, so basically handle them handle them really the same way as you'd handle your wiring. Um, so that's a very easy way just to keep track of them. Uh, you did see some where I obviously hadn't uh, put them in a bundle and I just sort of uh, had them going straight up into the layout. Um, but generally, I, I just cut them to just um, above the shortest length I need so that I'm not going too short, um, and that does very well. And especially because when you're putting them into the box, um, one of the features, um, grab one now, I'll come up a bit close to the camera. You see there's this um, grommet at the end, and it's actually got little splines on, on the end of the grommet and what happens, that really grabs the fibers very well. In fact, this one's been used, the grommet's a bit open right now. Um, so, yeah. So, handling the fibers from that point of view is quite easy. The smallest ones are a bit of a pain. Uh, 0.5 millimeter, they're getting down to being almost a hair's width. Um, and those are normally put together with, I'll put a bundle of those together and usually put them together with, say, a 1.5 millimeter fiber. So, I'm running a larger fiber over a distance and keep the, the smaller ones a little bit on the shorter side. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I think that's about all over in the chat here. I see um, you've actually got someone over in the chat answering some questions now. So what about you, Martin, in the YouTube chat? Anything there? Oh, uh, well, there's only one last thing there. Um, Jim was uh, mentioning there's still somewhat of a uh, spaghetti effect under the layout. Are there any wire management devices that you recommend, plastic raceways, that you've used successfully with the uh, fibre optics? I haven't actually used any raceways, but some of my customers have, um, and I think that's the perfect way to, to deal with it. Um, actually, one of the idea actually is, is very simple. Um, I've got a lamp lighter um, right now that's on, so I'm not going to shine it at the screen, but I'm going to stick 30 foot of fibre in here. 
and you can probably see plenty of light coming out of the end. Yeah. So and that's one of the beauties of this is once the light gets into the fiber, and that's actually, it's not easy to get light, a lot of light into a fiber. That's the big trick part. And that's what we've developed the technology around. Um, but once you do, it's actually going to stay in the fiber. So if you've got long lengths to run, um, you can, have, yeah, even out in garden railroads, right outside, you can bury the fiber very easily. And um, yeah, if you happen to chop through it with a spoon. And I'll give you one, one other tip that I didn't show on that. This is, this is one of my favorite tools. It's a stirring stick. I get those from McDonald's or somewhere else. Don't tell them, though. Um, and, and what that does is if I've got a fiber, I can really keep that fiber very straight within that stirring stick. Um, and it's just a great way to pop something up into a building or whatever. So I often use those as just little tricks to keep the fibers um, happy when they're going up into a building. Not a problem. Thanks very much, Michael. I, uh, that was a very informative uh, session on, on fiber and fiber optic uh, uh, lighting. So, um, yep, all that needs to be done now, I guess, Brad, is, uh, is the old wheel of chat. Yeah, definitely. I think we uh, we give that big wheel a spin. And I think what we'll do in this break is I'll actually uh, note down some of the answers and we might come back um, a couple of minutes early and we'll run through some of the answers. Okay, well, let's see. I wonder, I wonder what one's going to come up this time because you and I know what questions we've written in here and there are and cer one there, certain there's, there's ones that we... One. Yeah, there's certain ones we really want to come out. But anyway, here we go. Here's Michael's spin. What is the time with you? Did we have that one before? I'm not sure. I think we have. I think we, we did. did. I think we, we did. did. So oh, I think we we have another spin, eh? Yeah, we'll give it another go. It doesn't cost us anything. The wheel's free. This just gives me another opportunity for my favourite question to come and in. And it's come up with the same one again. Here we go. I'm determined. I'm determined to get something different here. Third time lucky. Steam or diesel, we've had that one. I think this might be the Australian Gremlin coming out. Yeah. We had that earlier on when I noticed we're upside down. Yeah, it's... Uh... Oh, there we go, something different. So, do you use DC or DCC? So, everybody out there in chat land, tell us what DC, whether you use DC or DCC. And uh, we'll break now to uh, the uh, timetable. And don't forget, there's a special on... Uh, you've got a code or something, haven't you, Brad, regarding the merchandise? Yeah, so the code is NMRAX20. And you'll get a 20% uh, discount on any of the merchandise that you order. And some of that proceeds will come back to help make this show bigger and better. Beautiful. Not a problem. We'll head over to there and we'll speak with you soon. Mm -hmm.